Welcome back everybody to Vlogging Through History. I want to do something a little different today and you may notice that this is me on the screen. Uh, I want to talk about one of my favorite stories from the American Civil War that it seems not nearly enough people know about. Now if you're familiar with my channel you've heard me talk about this story before. Uh, I've been a long time student of the battlefield at Gettysburg, of the Battle of Gettysburg. Been there probably 15 times. I talk about that a lot. It's one of my favorite historic sites to visit. Uh, and everybody loves to talk about the 20th Maine when it comes to the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, people love to talk about the Iron Brigade at Gettysburg. They'd love to talk about Pickett's Charge, but it seems like there's not nearly enough talked about when it comes to the first Minnesota. Uh, so I want to talk just a little bit about what happened at, with the 1st Minnesota on July 2nd at the battlefield at Gettysburg. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with that, but I want to show you a really cool resource that I found to really visualize that. So I'm going to start by showing you a clip from my most recent visit to the battlefield at Gettysburg. And this was about a year and a half ago. I was there like in January, so uh, you know everything's really brown. There's not a lot of people around, but this is the end of my video about Longstreet's assault, where I just kind of covered that whole July 2nd left side of the Union, right side of the Confederate uh, Army, uh, the battlefield. Uh, and if you want to see that entire video, I put a link in the description below. You can watch the entirety. I, I march up a little round top. I cover all kind of the highlights, the peach orchard, the wheat field, that stuff. Um, but this is the tail end of that video where I talk about the first Minnesota. And then I want to show you a video uh, from a very uh, lightly subscribed to channel that I think does a really cool thing with the video with the battlefield uh, at Gettysburg and, and visualizing the first Minnesota. So first let's uh, introduce the topic by watching one of my own videos. The final phase of Longstreet's assault that day on the Union left flank was to be an attack by a division of the Third Corps under AP Hill that was meant to be to the left of uh, General McClaw's division that was supposed to attack more to the center of Cemetery Ridge. That attack unfolded right around the time that General Hancock, who commanded the Second Corps, had sent Caldwell's division rushing into the wheat field to stop the Confederate attack under McClaws that had pushed through and broken the Third Corps. And so this area was lightly defended when a Confederate brigade under Wilcox came charging toward this position on Cemetery Hill. Hancock came Cemetery to Ridge. this area and found 262 men in the 1st Minnesota. It was the only regiment of Minnesota troops that was in the Army of the Potomac. It was also the first regiment of Minnesota troops that was raised during the war. The 262 men were under command of a man named William Colville. And when, when Hancock arrived and saw those men, he said, my God, is this all the men we have to defend this area? And then he famously orders Colville forward to charge with his 262 men and he says take those colors pointing to the colors uh, of the brigade under Wilcox. The Minnesota men bravely charge down the slopes behind me smash right into Wilcox's men and buy time with their lives for uh, for Hancock to bring up other reinforcements to uh, solidify this position. The Minnesota men lost 82% casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg. It was the highest number of casualties by any unit in the Union Army during the war. Only 47 men were left able to fight. And yet, miraculously, surprisingly, incredibly, the Minnesota men were also here on this position on July 3rd. And they have another monument up by, by the Copes of Trees because they helped to repel Pickett's Charge on day three. It's not so that's uh, kind of my overview of what happened with the first Minnesota. But what I want to do now is I want to actually take a look. And I'll need my glasses for this. Uh, I want to take a look at this video by TVM Enterprises. And I'll link in the description to that video for you as well. They've got 134 subscribers. Actually, let's make that 135. Uh, and they did something really cool with Google Maps. Uh, and they show the actual movement of all the troops and i thought this was really cool and a very unique way to visualize what happened with the first minnesota that day so let's take a look at it 
And this actually comes from something called CivilWarAnimatedBattles.com, which I'm going to register for because it looks like it's a really cool site. And I love what they've done here. The 1st Minnesota Regiment, part of Harrow's Brigade, Gibbon's Division, within Hancock's 2nd Corps, arrives from the south via the Tawny Town Road. With the rest of the brigade, they take up an initial position on the reverse slope of Cemetery Ridge shortly after 8.30 on the morning of day two. History takes note of the fact that the 1st Minnesota had only eight companies available when Hancock ordered their fateful charge late in the afternoon. And it's about 10 a.m. that the first of two companies, Company L, is detached. They move to the north to support Woodruff's battery, while the remaining nine companies stayed in their initial position with Harrow's brigade. As Barksdale was initiating his assault against Union brigades on the Emmitsburg Road, Harrow's brigade, in reserve to this point, was designated to be dispersed to provide support to these 3rd Corps units. Following the 19th Maine, the 1st Minnesota headed southwest and took up a position in support of Thomas's battery to their right and Rorty's battery on their left. As they formed their lines in this new location, Company F was detached and took up a position in the low ground to the front and left of the regiment. And it's important to note that if you go to the Gettysburg Battlefield and you stand in any of these places, you can see all of this. Uh, you know, you know everything that's happening with the Third Corps, with Bernie and Humphreys, uh, etc., um, you can see that from up here. So these guys were able to see everything that was happening. And as Barksdale's brigade slams into Graham, uh, and these guys uh, that are up in the peach orchard start to fall back. Like the 57th PA suffered 50% casualties in this battle. Uh, and part of the reason why I know that is because I had an uncle in the 57th PA. Uh, and his father was back here uh, on Cemetery Ridge with the 4th Pennsylvania Cavalry, which was their monument somewhere right in this area. And so he would have been watching his son's unit being decimated in the peach orchard. The 1st Minnesota's main body was now down to eight companies containing but 262 men. The Confederates were pushing toward the gap in the Union line. Union General Hancock had sent for reinforcements, but they would not arrive soon enough. All he had to plug the gap stood before him. My God, are these all the men we have? exclaimed Hancock. What regiment is this? It was the first Minnesota, and they were outnumbered at least six to one. And you should notice here that there are a bunch of other units in the area, but these Carr, Brewster, Willard, Willard had been killed, he'd been decapitated by a shell at this point. Um, but these guys had all already been fighting and had just been torn to pieces by Longstreet's assault. And so none of them were really available, even though you've got hundreds, probably thousands of men here to the uh, to the rear of the first Minnesota, it's these 262 men that Hancock calls upon to stop Wilcox's advance while units are coming from all the way over here uh, on the right flank of the uh, Union line uh, from the area around Culp's Hill. Hancock ordered them to charge. Colonel Colville ordered the regiment forward at the double quick, charging Wilcox's brigade, 150 yards down a slight slope, in the thicket to their front. The sight of the 1st Minnesota charging with bayonets leveled caused Wilcox's front line to momentarily fall back to their better ordered support line. The 1st Minnesota halted at the stream bed and fired a volley directly into the faces of their reorganizing foe. And you can see here why this is so important because right here you've got the 125th New York, 126th New York, 111th New York, and the 105th PA. And they have successfully slowed down, I think this is Barksdale's brigade here, these Mississippians. They've stopped them there. 
But this is where the gap was. There was nothing to protect right here. And if Wilcox breaks through here, they successfully split the Union Army in half. Taking cover among the rocks and overgrowth, the firing became general, each man loading and firing independently as fast as they could. But Wilcox's line was longer on both flanks and began to envelop the first Minnesota. The left wing of the 9th Alabama pressed the Minnesota in its right, and Company I swung back to meet the threat. The first Minnesota only survived complete destruction because, as Harry Fonts writes, quote, Wilcox could not or did not organize a counterattack. His unsupported, advanced position and the threat of more and larger attacks loomed large in his mind. Yeah, you got to see, and this is important to visualize this, because if you're Wilcox and you're watching this, okay, we can probably get on either side of the 1st Minnesota, but what happens when the 8th Alabama hits the 1st Minnesota's flank and the 10th Alabama falls back and suddenly you get attacked on your flank? He's watching... And he's seeing that Barksdale's collapsed on his right, so he's got no support now on his right. He's in danger of being enveloped. And so while the first Minnesota charge is an incredibly brave thing to do, and it definitely made a huge difference, there were other factors uh, at play here. So he ordered his regiments back to avoid destruction or capture, unquote. As Wilcox began to withdraw... Colville saw his chance to take the rest of what was left of the regiment back to the crest of Cemetery Ridge. And, and notice what's happening back here, too, while this is going on. There's reorganization happening among these two brigades that have dissolved in the attacks uh, over closer to the Peach Orchard. They're starting to get their men back into position. This is, what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I mean, there's like, what, 10, 12 regiments here? Uh, and you've got the uh, second, eighth, and fifth Florida breaking through over here. So, you know, there's major issues all the way along the line right here that have to be addressed. Only 47 men of the 262 that advanced were present when they eventually collected around their colors. In about 15 minutes, 215 officers and men, 82% of the eight companies of the 1st Minnesota that charged, had fallen. Hancock later wrote that the regiment had, quote, sustained the greatest percentage loss of any Union regiment at Gettysburg or during the war. And President Calvin Coolidge would come to Gettysburg uh, you know, half a century later, and he said that the 1st Minnesota uh, is rightly entitled to the label Saviors of America for what they did. Unquote. As a historical footnote, Company F, detached from the regiment prior to the critical engagement with Wilcox's brigade, joined up with the Third Corps remnants rallied together by General Humphreys and took part in the final repulse of Anderson's Confederate division and the recovering of several Union guns. Yeah, there were a couple of batteries that had been captured right in here, and you can see that uh, Turnbull. You can also see the 13th Vermont up here. I think that's part of Stannard's brigade, but I'm not sure. Uh, they basically drove off an entire brigade themselves. Now, they were a bigger unit. I think this was their first action. So they were as large as some of the Union brigades were. Uh, but they were able to drive off uh, a number of these Georgians. The Flor Floridians are being driven back. But you can see, it, it's just really cool to visualize that. And I'm going to see if I can register for the CivilWarAnimatedBattles.com site because I think it would be really cool to get access to this information. I think it's a really neat way of looking at this, especially as I plan to take another trip to uh, the Gettysburg Battlefield this fall, and hopefully some of you guys can join me for that. But let me know your thoughts about all that. Uh, did anything surprise you? Maybe you've heard the first Minnesota story before, but uh, for me, it was cool to see it that way and to understand it a little better. Use the comment section below. Let me know. Hit that like button. Check out uh, the links that I've uh, added below to those two videos that we just took a look at. Thanks for watching.